Well, I think I would just kick off with a quick introduction while we um, while we wait for um, some more participants to join us. My name is Florence from the Food Foundation, for those of you who don't know me yet. Um, and it's a pleasure to be here today, uh, welcoming you all to the final webinar in our emergency food planning series, which began back in uh, November. Um, we've uh, covered a lot of ground this series. It's been fascinating hearing from lots of different experts and speakers from all around the globe. Um, and we're so pleased that you could all join us today to, um, to consolidate this learning and to look at the roadmap um, ahead. Uh, this has been part of our Food Cities 2022 Learning Partnership, um, which the Food Foundation um, began uh, early last year. Uh, we're bringing together some cities from across the Commonwealth with a real focus on low to middle income countries. Uh, we've been running two webinar series um, so far. This is the second. Um, the first was on creating a food strategy. We've built a learning platform, which we'll be telling you more about towards the end um, of the webinar today. Um, and we're also um, looking forward to a third webinar series, um, which again, we'll, uh, we'll touch upon at the end um, of today's session. Um, I'll uh, drop a link to our learning platform um, into the chat, so we'd encourage you to, to take a look at that. Um, a little bit of housekeeping, um, we are recording, so if you don't wish to be on camera, please turn your cameras off. However, we would love to see your faces, so if you're um, happy to do so, please turn them on. Um, please use the chat box throughout. We're gonna be having Q and A's um, during and um, towards the end of the webinar. Uh, so feel free to put your hand up when the time comes or to put your questions in the chat chat box um, and of course please remember to keep yourself on mute um, when you're not speaking. Um, so I'm going to hand straight over to Kim. Kim's the founder of the Feeding Cities Group which is a social enterprise dedicated to creating more resilient urban food systems and she's been our lead consultant in designing and delivering um, this webinar series um, and she's done a superb job of it. We've been um, really thrilled to have worked with her and her colleague Kelsey. So I'm going to hand straight over to Kim. Thank you. Thanks, Florence. Really appreciate it. And Kelsey, I'll give you a moment to screen share ours. Thank you very much. Um, so welcome, everyone, to the final in our webinar series. This is webinar five, and we're so excited to be here. We're, we're so thankful for the opportunity the Food Foundation gave us to work with them on this webinar series around emergency food planning. So relevant, so important. And, and as far as we know, there hasn't been any dedicated effort like this to help cities think about their emergency food response and recovery, which we think of as a subset of um, overall resilience planning. And, and with that, we'll, we'll just kick it off. But again, want to thank our wonderful partners, Florence, Shaleen, who couldn't make it today, and Anna, um, who, who just joined from the Food Foundation as well. And they'll, they'll come back at the end of this webinar. Um, and share some of their reflections and thoughts. So Kelsey, if we want to go ahead and kick off our presentation, I'll also be moderating. Um, and then Kelsey and Florence will be moderating chat. So yep, Florence just popped something in there. So great that chat's working for you. So the motivation, how did we come here? Barbara Emanuel is on as well. So I want to give her a shout out if she can wave her hand, um, if you all can see her face there. Working with Barbara and C40, Stefania and Shaleen and right and the the Food Foundation, right? We realized coming out of the pandemic, there was another scramble for emergency food, which happens all the time. The responses are slow; they're inadequate. The right experts are not engaged. Larger commitments are forgotten. Barbara has a great story about Toronto, but other cities exactly the same thing happens. Often you have new administrators in charge. We hear about it over and over again. Um, the goal of this webinar series is to have cities start developing these emergency food plans within broader food strategies. Great, Kelsey, if we can go ahead. Excellent. So when we started to think about how best to frame this, you know, at the core of our perspective, the Feeding Cities Group perspective on this is that emergency food isn't monolithic. You have to think about the different crises that are driving it in your cities to plan appropriately. And the crises that cities might face, we think about falling into four big buckets. Pandemic, obviously, that affected everyone. Refugees is affecting 
many, many cities globally, more cities than ever before. Natural disasters, again, more cities than ever before, and conflict and growth. Also, we lump those together uh, because they have um, some similar drivers, and that was our very last webinar. So the four webinars that we've had uh, were around these framed around these topics. We developed some companion resources to go with them called Tactics to Try and curated a very small set of resources to work with that. That's all on the great learning platform website that, that Florence helped develop at the Food Foundation. And so please go back, look at all of the webinars. They're all recorded as well as all of the great resources. Kelsey, go ahead. So who's joined us? We wanted to just do a quick analysis and reflect a bit on what we've learned through this webinar series. We're a little surprised that over half came from North America. This, this is meant to be a global webinar series, uh, but I think in terms of marketing and a real hunger for this information, what's interesting is that North America, for the first time, and I've been doing this work for about a decade, cities in North America are more and more interested in thinking about uh, their food systems as, as being fragile when they've always thought about food as being one of the things that they never needed to worry about in America, and now they are, especially in the cities. But as you can see, very global. Uh, which is wonderful. And this is just data for 208. We've had more registrants than that, but this was the data where they located, where they indicated where they were located from. Right, Kelsey, the next one. So the key takeaways from the webinar series, we've learned a lot as always. It's one of the reasons we took on this project is we always learn when we try to curate resources, go through them again, think about framing, think about speakers. We talk to I don't know, Kelsey, how many potential speakers and speakers throughout the webinar series, maybe 50 in different cities. It was wonderful. That involved some 4 a.m. phone calls to meet people where they were uh, and some late night calls as well, which was, which was uh, worth it, honestly, from what we learned. Cities, very different places in terms of emergency food planning. There are some that still just need the motivation. And then there are others that have some nascent plans want to do more. Really a wide gap does not seem to be a function of their sophistication as a city overall. Just really very depends on who's championing it. Also depends on if they've had a major disaster that they've dealt with recently. Planning needs to happen at the city level, even smaller cities, which are often being overlooked, the missing middle. We heard about that in our last webinar. But planning needs to happen at the city level because that is where uh, the crises are happening and cities are scrambling to deal with it, even though they're getting some support. If it's a federal national crisis, cities still have to leverage all of their resources and need some plan in place. City regional government authorities don't have sufficient resources to address it. It requires that national government support, requires coordinated action with the voluntary sector. Everyone needs to be involved to adequately address a food crisis and working together in ways that they never have before. But one of the things we've heard about is a best practice is a permanent food team needs to be established before the next crisis, that's essential. And what we've seen in the pandemic, as we've seen in other crises, food teams get created it's really important for governments to have that coordinated function. It's important for the voluntary sector. And then as soon as the crisis is over, that food team is disbanded and the wheel is recreated during the next disaster. So we strongly advocate for that permanent food, food team. Monitoring is huge, huge. How do we know who's hungry now? Who's gonna be hungry in the next six months? Where the food is, how we get the food to those who need it most, data tracking, real-time monitoring. We brought in famine monitoring, which is very well established, been around for a decade or so, really refined methodology, methodology and something we can perhaps learn from. Investing in food businesses, as important as investing in agriculture. And we don't often hear about that when we think about local food systems, but it's the food businesses, it's the markets, it's the processing, et cetera, that's also really critical. Thanks, Kelsey. Next. So roadmap for recovery planning at the end of the webinar series, instead of 
uh, of final tactics to try from elsewhere, we synthesized everything we learned from the webinar series and created the beginning of what will continue to refine and develop at the Feeding Cities Group, and that's a roadmap for cities to help them navigate the emergency food response and recovery planning. And that's again available. I think, yeah, Florence did send that out to everyone who participated. It's also on the learning platform resources. It's a starting place. It's not the be all end all. But from what we've learned through this, through this process of developing the webinar series as well of our research, there are these five building blocks to that roadmap. First, it's gaining that authorization, coalition building, it's building that business case, figuring out who else you need to bring in, establishing that ownership and leadership, communication, monitoring, securing those resources and planning for the long run. Again, one of the other key learnings that we've learned over the past decade or so is that the disasters and crises hitting cities affecting food crises are lasting for a very, very prolonged period of time. It's not weeks, it's months, if you're lucky, years more likely. Thanks, Kelsey, in the next slide. So we're really excited. Just a quick snap at the learning platform resources we put together for this webinar, our final webinar. And then Kelsey, if we can look at who our speakers are, we're just so excited with the lineup that we have for this webinar series. So I kicked it off and then we have the C40 perspective, Stefania, Emmanuel, Edwin, are going to talk about, Emmanuel and Edwin are in cities that are part of C40. Then we're gonna hear from Milan Urban Food Policy Pact. Filippo, thank you for joining us. Dr. Jess Holliday from Ruoff is gonna talk about their really innovative city region food system she's working on with FAO. And then a city level perspective, Tokiana is going to talk about both Ruoff and MUFPP. And then Barbara Manuel, we talked about at the beginning, she's gonna reflect on the whole series and Anna at the Food Foundation is gonna wrap it up. So thank you everyone. We have a total of an hour and 50 minutes dedicated to this webinar. So we have some time for chat as well. Great, Kelsey, I think we're next slide if you can. It's not frozen, great and excellent. So with that, I'm gonna kick it over to Stefania and ask Stefania to share your screen. I think I saw in the chat, Stefania, that you were just, under a different name. I think yes, yes, we don't. It would be great for everybody in there. the call if you could just click on your name in the participant list and rename yourself by adding your real name, not Guido's name, uh, and the city you're calling from. So it's easier for everybody to understand because we got, I think, 20 Guidos because uh, it was. That's this link was shared. Yes. <laughs> Sorry for that. Great. Well, Stefania, let me just briefly introduce you. So glad you could make it. If you want to start screen sharing. Yeah. Excellent. So she oversees the Food Systems Network as part of C40's Urban Planning and Develop Initiative. Before joining C40, she worked as a policy advisor at the Mayor's Office of Milan, where she focused on the Milan Urban Food Policy Pact. So she can, she's an expert in both. She also worked at WHO. She has a PhD from UCSC in Milan and the London School of Economics. So Stefania. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, okay, so very happy to be here uh, and talk uh, uh, together with Emmanuel and uh, Edwin about um, um, how C40 and uh, C40 cities uh, have been working on this topic in the last um, couple of years, unfortunately. <laughs> Uh, clearly, it all uh, started with uh, with the pandemic. Our, you know, I would say, group reflection. In general terms, for the one of, of you who don't know C40, C40 is a network of uh, 97 mega cities uh, working on climate action and in, in, in specific in the food system network, which is the working group inside C40 uh, discussing and working on food uh, and sustainable food. Um, so um, we got a declaration that basically set, set up the vision uh, for the work we're doing inside C40 with our cities. Uh, and you can find everything online uh, about C40 in general and the food system network more specifically. Um, so I just wanted to uh, bring a little bit of some of some uh, insights of, 
uh, what happened uh, and how we have worked uh, during uh, the outbreak uh, in March, June uh, 2020. And then some of my reflection uh, out of that uh, specific work. Um, what we did immediately, and the first uh, of these office hours was really was on the 7th of March. So basically, it was a couple of weeks after the first, uh, um, the first, the patient zero here in Italy, which kind of started the kind of the wave in the, the Europe and the uh, US, North America and Latin America. Um, it was two weeks after that we gathered uh, all um, uh, food uh, policy directors from, from our cities kind of tried to discuss uh, what was going on. We were lucky. We had some, some of our uh, uh, food um, city official based in Wuhan that was sharing with us scaring pictures about what was going on. So it, it went on very quickly. Uh, and uh, we, we opened the platform really like uh, uh, to, 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 to really be used by cities to understand what, what, what need, needed to be done. Um, we also created a little bit of a manual uh, of uh, uh, everything that uh, our cities, I mean, the best things that uh, uh, our thing, our cities uh, uh, were doing. And we shared this document uh, throughout C40 cities, but also all other cities network uh, we were in contact with uh, because we thought uh, it could have been useful for everybody to know how some of the city around the world were dealing uh, with, uh, with emergency food distribution during the pandemic. Uh, we really, as, a, uh, as New York uh, uh, um, prominently, I, I think, uh, summarized the, the what cities were doing, they were really using this eyeball approach. So first really looking at uh, the most vulnerable, uh, the, the usual vulnerables, but including the quarantine people, and then looking at basically the general supply uh, for the city. Uh, and uh, we had um, the food teams basically split uh, to work on these two uh, levels. Uh, and it was very tiring and impressive. And, you know, discussions have been going on forever. Um, now, few things about what we learned uh, during that period that we tried to distill down in uh, subsequent webinars and meeting we had with network cities. First of all, um, so emergency really bring a lot of new resources in the food assistance infrastructure, but uh, the food assistance existing infrastructure needs to be very strong to take all those resources. And if, if the impression, and I think this is something that we discussed uh, uh, later on, not during the real first outbreak, but later on we realized that whenever the, the existing infrastructure seemed to be not strong enough to take all of that, parallel structures have been created. Uh, and that uh, I believe and we believed was a big loss not just for the, for the city, but for the beneficiaries, for the whole ecosystems, food ecosystem, uh, because of a lot of the nuances that uh, food professionals working on uh, and food teams working on food all day long for years have been lost. A lot of those inside have been lost in the chain. Um, so as I was saying, you know, more people in need, more funds, more players. All of these, you know, the, the, the outbreak, the crisis emerge, and all of this is immediately uh, getting on the shoulders of the, of the existing infrastructure. Now, what we think uh, uh, it is in place, and, in, and, and the thing we probably need to consider more and more, is that the real pillars that are going under stress during this crisis are you know, the distribution system, the voucher system, everything that, that that system that is already in place, working with people in need on a daily basis. That is the first one going under stress. Second, the team of professionals uh, and all their relation, that's a second crucial pillar that goes again under stress during this crisis. But the third thing, and the, the one thing I think really, uh, 
it, it really matters in this situation during this crisis in not to lose the vision. So the vision is the one that, uh, and I will explain in, in a second, really help deliver the most creative solutions during the outbreak as well. Um, the, 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 the existing infrastructure and the teams, those have been crucial during the response because based on that and on the existing programs, uh, amazing response projects have been delivered. And just to give you a few examples, like what we've seen, the distribution point in New York, uh, so those have been, that's the whole infrastructure that was built around the fact that, you know, like New York, the city of New York was really controlling the canteens and having already some contracts in place. So out of that, you know, the whole food distribution system uh, that supported people no ID required in New York throughout all the pandemic, that system was created. Um, a, different, uh, a different case, as you can see from the amount of pasta cleared in Milan, um, uh, it, it, uh, uh, it, these, uh, these places uh, and all the distribution, food distribution infrastructure that was created by Milan, it kind of built up on the food hub uh, distribution food up system they were having, meaning they were already in contact with a lot of retailers because they were we, they were uh, kind of getting uh, donation surplus food donation to to deliver to be delivered to people in need. Now that infrastructure was the one upon which they created the response uh, program uh, and the food uh, and the emergency food distribution program. So, you know, it's, it's, it's basically grounded in what is already happening in the city and then a big push with more funds, more people, more player. Why uh, I said the vision, I think that uh, sticking to the vision and to the knowledge of the chronic trouble of, of our uh, local uh, urban food systems, some really creative mechanism can put, be put in place. And I think um, uh, um, both uh, Emmanuel and Edwin will complement on this, but one of the most interesting uh, uh, idea and project I've seen uh, in response of the pandemic uh, was really like the, the mechanism set in place by some US cities where basically to both support the restaurants, the local farmer, and then bring food to the people in need. They created these virtuous circles whereby the funds, the emergency fund was given to the restaurants uh, who were buying from the local farmers who were providing, and, 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 and the restaurants, restaurants were preparing food for people in need. So, you know, like the, the circuits that, that that funds had done had, you know, hit multiple, uh, um, uh, multiple beneficiaries uh, in the food sectors and at the end of the chain at, at, uh, at, in terms of, of people. Uh, and it also Im dramatically improved the quality of the food that was provided. So these kind of, I believe this kind of solution, we can't, you know, we, every crisis is different in a way. And I know uh, <laughs> Kim, you know, like I, I love your, your four uh, bucket and I, and I, I believe uh, um, that that can really, you know, that, that really makes sense. Uh, at the same time, you know, the pandemic uh, was quite peculiar in a way that um, uh, the supply chain was not that hit as it would have been with a, with a, with a disaster, uh, or a natural disaster, for example, or a war. Um, so in this specific case, this model, uh, it, it, it was just, Perfect because it hit on different uh, um, uh, um, on different microgroups on different targets. Uh, in in other uh, emergencies, you know the, the the mechanism might need to be different. But I believe that these uh, these specific project came out of a of came out of the knowledge that the people in charge had of the chronic troubles of the local food systems. Uh, we knew, you know, they, they knew that the quality of, of the food provided uh, by food assistance program was low. 
and it's always been. And, and you know, during a pandemic, during an emergency can, all, can only go down, you know. And, and so it was very risky in that, in that respect. They knew like, and they really felt the troubles coming from the restaurant sectors and how complicate, complicated it was for them. And same thing for the local farmers. So they put all these things together and created this ama amazing virtuous kind of uh, circle. Uh, so I think, you know, opportunity come from sticking to the vision uh, and, uh, you know, few few of my thoughts about what needs to be in this emergency planning. So procedures, I, I guess it goes back a little bit to what uh, Kim was saying, also the authorization and identification of the leadership, that's very crucial. Uh, distribution points, so existing infrastructure, partner registry. So the, we, the people and cities need to know who, uh, who they can count on, which retailers, uh, uh, which wholesaler, that is very crucial and establish relation with these people is crucial at the time of crisis. And last but not least, data sets of uh, beneficiaries of people in need. Of course, that is exploding during, um, uh, during emergency, but at least uh, to get a starting, to have a starting point uh, and to be able to merge the different data sets coming from different departments, it is crucial uh, to, to, to start, you know, at, at, at least doing you know, the basic math when 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 you need to react and, Stefania, uh, and i think that's oh, me. Perfect. yep we're just thank you stefania sorry to cut you off just in the interest of time that was wonderful emmanuel do you think you could start to share your screen uh stefania that is so great emmanuel is a sustainable development officer of Quezon city which is the largest city in the philippines he's the co-chairperson of their food security task force which was created at the height of the pandemic and um, so he's been involved in, in C40 as well. So with that, I'll hand it off to you, Emmanuel. Thank you so much for joining us. Yes, thank you. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Magandang umaga, magandang gabi, magandang hapon uh, to all of you. And uh, first of all, I'd like to congratulate uh, Food Foundation Global, uh, Global Food Systems and the other organizers for this event. And thank you for the opportunity to share. Um, as mentioned, the uh, Quezon City, is the largest city in Metro Manila, the center of the Philippines in Southeast Asia. And we are a member of the C40. And as part of the member of the C40 group, we have actually four um, declarations in support. Uh, but since our topic today is about good food, so we'll be uh, sharing our experience on our good food cities declaration and the urban nature declaration. Um, in particular, also as a response to the global pandemic, which has uh, brought um, hunger, and loss of jobs. We have we uh, introduced a program called Grow QC, Pagunlad sa Pagkain, Kabuhayan, Kalusugan in Tagalog. But in English, it's the creation of food, livelihood, and better health, both mental and physical, uh, together. So this addresses SDG 2, Zero Hunger, 8, uh, Decent Work and Economic Growth, as well as good food, uh, good health and well being. So to be able to uh, explain what Grow QC is, uh, please watch this video. Sorry, can I just jump in a second, Emmanuel? Um, the audio is not working. We can't hear the audio there. Oh, um, hold on. I'm not sure if there's an option to share audio or if um, if not, I can have try, a go. Yeah, let me try again. Okay. Congratulations oh, to- You can hear it now. Eh, yeah. Grow QC. Kasama ka sa pag-unlad sa pagkain, kabuhayan at kalusugan food security program, Quezon City. When the lockdown was imposed in 2020, the local government of Quezon City needed to think of a strategy that would ensure food security and self-sustainability within the bounds of the city. This prompted the LGU to launch a seven-point action plan to boost the city's urban farming and promote sustainable food systems in the communities. Idle lands were converted into abundant food sources. Displaced workers were given alternative sources of income, and the community 
had immediate access to healthy and nutritious food. QC program empowered communities, especially during the hardest lockdown. The solutions are not new. However, implementation strategies allowed the city to make more land productive and connected people, processes, and programs to show that the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. This is to prove that through mutual and strong collaboration between the government and its people, cities can be livable, green, and resilient. Congratulations. So as mentioned in the video, the Grow QC Action Plan uh, first started by the creation of the task force uh, at the height of the pandemic. And then from there, a uh, uh, food security framework was created primarily to respond to the pandemic. Um, we enhanced and grew our urban agriculture program, but we also looked into how can we improve the food systems, in particular when there's a lockdown. Uh, we also had a roadmap to follow, which has three phases. The first is a quick assessment and immediate response. Uh, one of this is to establish a hunger map using the data that we have to identify the most food vulnerable sectors. And within that year, we actually had a partnership with UNFAO to validate that uh, information. And indeed, uh, the top, even the top 10 barangays with the most food vulnerable uh, sectors was, were identified. The second phase would be capacity building and transformation, primarily organization and training. Um, and third would be the long-term food security and nutrition sustainability phase. Um, just a, a two-year program, we've already achieved the following. When we started off uh, at the start of the pandemic, we had about 400 urban farmers in our database. But just after two years, we had more than 2,000 farmers. Uh, at the start of the pandemic, we uh, surveyed around 280,000 square meters of idle land, unproductive land. But by uh, August of 2021, we actually had 342,000 uh, square meters of land um, that was actually being uh, productive already. Um, we started at around 50 urban farms and gardens. Uh, in just two years, we had 303. And Quezon City boasts of the largest urban farm in the whole Metro Manila at about seven hectares. So the, just some highlights of that. Um, key takeaways, um, the food policy and resilience plan. One is the legislation, um, the creation of the task force by itself. Second was that we looked into our uh, tax, uh, idle land tax laws, which we amended in order to encourage that more idle lands be converted. Um, to be productive spaces in terms of producing food. And the most recent was the passing of the healthy food uh, procurement law, which basically states that no uh, government or no government funds will be spent on an unhealthy food. This actually allows a potential market for our urban farmers to supply the caterers and, and uh, that, that feed the city or the programs in our city. Um, but as mentioned earlier also, uh, particularly when it's a pandemic or an emergency response. Um, nothing beats participation and empowerment and involvement. So a multi-sectoral approach, um, really talking um, with the people and finding solutions together um, really allows us to get through uh, the hardest of times. So thank with that, uh, I was just given five minutes. Thank so thank you. Yes, and uh, thank, thank you for the opportunity to share. <laughs> Emmanuel, that's amazing. And sorry, we don't have more time for that because as, as you saw in chat, hopefully there is lots of, I feel like everyone wanted to use that uh, amazing reaction button in, a, in Zoom. So thanks, Emmanuel. Edwin, if you want to start sharing your screen. Now we're moving to Austin, Texas. He's a food policy manager there for the city's Office of Sustainability. Um, he has a degree in anthropology from the University of Oregon. He's worked on sustainable farming projects around the world, an active participant in C40. I believe uh, Aust Austin, Texas has won, won a few awards, and certainly in the U.S. We always look to see what Austin's up to in this uh, food strategy and planning. So with that, I'll hand it off to Edwin. Thanks so much. Uh, really appreciate it. I'm Edwin Marty, the food policy manager of the city of Austin, Texas in the United States. Um, and just want to give a quick shout out to the uh, last uh, presenter, Emmanuel. That was an amazing um, 
uh, story and uh, honestly just kind of humbled to hear the amazing work done uh, in the Philippines. So um, love these sessions where we get to find out great stuff happening across the world. So um, real quickly, I'm going to share sort of a quick summary of how we structure our food system and food policy team within the city of Austin. Talk a little bit about our work to create a comprehensive food system plan that will include uh, emergency food access and vulnerability analysis of our supply chain and some lessons learned. Uh, so first off, um, the way we structure our food team in the city of Austin, um, like many cities across the country and across the world, uh, positioning food systems work within a city government is difficult. There are very few examples of uh, standalone food departments in both municipal governments or federal governments. Um, and so what we've done is essentially tried to um, look at the cross-cutting nature of food across city departments and document where food action is already happening. My position as the food policy manager is, uh, was originally the only truly uh, cross-cutting position for the city created in 2014. Um, since then, uh, my position within the Office of Sustainability has been able to add a couple of more positions over the last couple of years. So we now have a couple of permanent positions that focus on food systems, but that work only functions when it's done in concert with other departments and obviously with the private sector. Um, we do have a comprehensive plan called Imagine Austin um, that looks 30 years out. We also have a five-year plan called uh, Strategic Direction 2023. As you see on this slide here, sort of how we've structured um, basically cutting across the lens of our strategic plan to see how food fits in, our public health department, parks and rec, our solid waste departments, planning, watershed, emergency management, all of these different departments fit into um, the way we view food. The structure here is critically important as we get into our planning work and we think about disaster response. Um, to document this work, we've been publishing state of the food systems reports. We've got uh, one from 2015, one from 2018. We'll be publishing a new state of the food system report this year that will document much of the food planning work that you're about to hear about. Um, so like many cities, in fact, all cities across the world, um, in March of 2020, the city of Austin launched an emergency operations center to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic. What was unique about this emergency operations center, however, was the creation of the social service branch within our emergency operations center. So instead of just responding to a typical disaster with a fairly short window of expected response time, we knew that the pandemic would be a long term issue, perhaps not quite as long as it has played out, but uh, we really realized that it would be a long-term issue. And so the social service branch was created to provide long-term care and support services to vulnerable community members. Within that social service branch, the Office of Sustainability was brought in to help uh, with a food response. Uh, so we worked in concert with um, folks from across departments of the city and most importantly, across the community with the nonprofit sector and the private sector to create a food access coordination group um, this group convened and coordinated and communicated and sought funding and distribution of funds uh, in response. Um, very quickly, the most important parts here from my perspective uh, was the development of relationships with our private sector, uh, specifically our local farming community and uh, the local restaurant community. Uh, many restaurants were closed because of COVID-19. Fortunately, through uh, direct funding from the city, uh, many restaurants and restaurant clusters were able to um, stay open and employ their staff in uh, an effort to provide prepared meals to people that were experiencing lockdown across the community. Um, so we were able to direct about $10 million a year towards that private sector, uh, very successful um, uh, from an economic perspective and from a food access and um, uh, food insecurity perspective. Uh, we also did a fair amount of mapping to understand where food access needs were the greatest. This was perhaps one of the more complicated parts of the project. As many of you probably understand, addressing and understanding real-time food insecurity is very difficult. We traditionally do this uh, retroactively or retrospectively over a, a matter of years. 
Uh, but we did enlist the help of the University of Texas School of Public Health to document what we call food assets, basically where food was being distributed for free. Uh, those are the black dots on this slide. And then we overlaid that with calls to our what we call 211 hotline, which is the phone number that anybody can call to find out where emergency food and other resources are available. This map basically is a, a helpful tool to understand the disconnect between where the highest call volumes are coming in versus where the actual food assets are. And this map helped us direct resources, additional resources in uh, the places where we had uh, limited food access resources. So simultaneously to COVID-19, the state of Texas experienced a winter storm in 2021, in February 2021. So on top of the COVID disaster, we had an unprecedented winter storm that knocked out the power grid in the state of Texas and radically impacted the city of Austin as well as other cities across uh, Texas. Um, we experienced uh, very significant uh, power loss and uh, plumbing water, potable water access issues. Um, the food access team from the COVID-19 response was mobilized and moved into action to help provide immediate food and water uh, needs across the city. This was a completely unprecedented issue. We'd never experienced anything like this in modern times in the city of Austin. Um, we were able to build on the relationships that we had established during COVID-19, as well as develop new relationships with mutual aid groups to ensure that we were able to distribute food and potable water to the community. Uh, many challenges, however, many lessons learned. Um, to be frank, the COVID-19 pandemic and the winter storm led to um, the City Council of Austin recognizing that we didn't have a comprehensive food plan and needed a comprehensive food plan. In addition, the City of Austin published a climate plan uh, last year that indicated that there were significant areas of opportunity for addressing our greenhouse gas footprint through our food system. So what I call the trifecta of challenges created the opportunity uh, for Council to fund and direct us to create a comprehensive food plan. So very quickly, we're viewing this as an opportunity to create a nested food planning process. Where we'll have uh, at the core of this, a disaster response for emergency food and water distribution. On top of that, we'll do a vulnerability analysis to understand where our current supply chain has the most weaknesses and potential gaps. And then we'll be uh, developing a comprehensive food plan that incorporates this disaster food plan, the food resilience plan, and communities perspective on what they would like to see aspirationally their food system look like in the future. So we've done pretty extensive work on documenting the challenges from the winter storm in what we call an after action report. We'll be using that after action report as the foundation for the development of our emergency food access plan. We'll be doing resilience planning over the next couple of years to really understand what our supply chain looks like and where those gaps are. And we'll be adding all of that into a comprehensive food plan. So our food plan will be launched this summer, uh, 2021, uh, sorry, 2022, uh, doing extensive community engagement to understand where vulnerable communities um, see themselves within the food system and where uh, those community members would like to see governments direct resources to improve the food system and where governments can help collaborate with the private sector to create a more functional and better food system. Um, so the lessons learned, I'll spend one minute chatting about this. Um, lots of interesting conversations through both COVID-19 and the winter storm about the role of the city in food access. Is it the role of the city to provide food during disasters? That's a, actually a pretty interesting question, and it's not one that has been answered. Across the United States, traditionally, the Red Cross and large food banks often play that role of responding to disasters. It's been recognized that perhaps there needs to be a very clear role for municipal and county governments, and, and certainly state and federal governments, but the local government needs to have a clearly defined role in disasters disaster response. Uh, the local government has the best finger on the pulse comparatively uh, to the state or the federal government about what the culturally specific and dietary needs are in a community. And this can't be understated. Um, critically important that as we think about both having a disaster response plan and an ongoing comprehensive plan for improving our food system that we take into consideration the very specific kinds of food that a community would like to have and needs to have. 
Uh, there's also a real question about the difference between a response and a recovery effort versus chronic food issues. Uh, we have ongoing food insecurity in the city of Austin. Disasters exacerbate that problem. Where do we cut the line or where do we draw the line though between a response and a recovery and those chronic issues? Uh, clarity is needed um, so that resources can be correctly allocated. Um, very quickly, lastly, I do want to touch on the question about uh, the fact that food doesn't fit into a neat box. You can't talk about an emergency food plan without also talking about transportation issues, without also talking about healthcare issues, without also talking about housing issues. Uh, we at the city of Austin try to recognize this interplay between food access needs, food insecurity issues, and affordability issues and transportation issues. So in an emergency food access setting uh, where we're trying to ensure that the uh, vast majority of our community has access to good, healthy, affordable food. We're also doing that in concert with other parts of our government that are looking at ensuring there is access to affordable housing, that there is a functional multimodal transport, public transportation system. Um, so I think that's all the time I've got now, but uh, thank you so much. Thanks. And I will turn off. Thank you. Share. Yeah, thank you, Edwin. That that's so remarkable. And just for everyone on this call, our company, Defeating Cities Group, again, we will enter that into chat, Kelsey. But the experience and the lessons learned in Austin are universal in the cities in North America. We've been studying this for about 10 years. And if you'll look at some of our research on it, same thing over and over. The as Edwin said, how do you how do you um how do you find that distinction between what is the crisis response and then recovery and right we often use whatever the the crisis responders are in the plans and typically that has been two weeks so they think of it as a two week response which we know isn't adequate and then the rest is recovery and that's exactly the space that we work in with cities so edwin thank you so much for that so so enlightening for that whole c40 panel that was great i think we have time for one question here florence if any have popped up in chat while well, filippo if you want to get your presentation ready and share your screen we don't have any questions in the chat but if anyone has one and they'd like to put their hand up um, and come forward then please do great. so All right, and we'll have time at the end as well, but please enter your questions in chat. We will get to them. Thank you, Filippo. Excellent. So now to the Milan Urban Food Policy Pact, where Filippo is head of that within the mayor's office of Milan. Uh, he animates a network of more than 200 cities that are working together. So another broad city network like C40, and they're working together towards more sustainable food systems. Previously, he was a policy advisor with the mayor where he oversaw the implementation of Milan's food policy and, and the response during COVID. So with that, I'll turn it over to Filippo. And again, just as a, as a heads up to everyone, Filippo is gonna be followed by Jess from Ruoff and then Tokiana will present uh, the city perspective on both MUFPP and the Ruoff work. Filippo, I hand it Thank off you to you. So much. Thank you so much also for, for inviting me. Um, I would like to give you a general overview of what the pact is and uh, uh, to focus on the, let's say, the main activities and funding uh, um, about, uh, let's say, our, our action during the, in this case, during the emergency. So um, the Milan Urban Food Policy Pact is a, is a global uh, network. It's a commitment of more than 200 mayors that you can see in this, uh, in, uh, in this map that uh, are working together to um, implement more sustainable urban food system. And uh, uh, the pact that was uh, funded in, in 2015 has uh, an holistic approach towards food system. So uh, you can see in this slide, uh, a cluster, uh, how we cluster the 37 recommended actions in, uh, for example, in governance, in uh, sustainable diets and nutrition, social and economic equity, that has been a uh, key, uh, let's say, a key category during, uh, for example, the, the COVID emergency, and uh, through, let's say, the supply chain of food, so uh, food production, that means, for example, um, the improving the urban and peri-urban agriculture and uh, the um, rural urban linkages. And 
uh, the logistic of food, so food supply and distribution, the organization of markets and wholesale market, and uh, the, um, the um, food waste uh, reduction, food losses and waste reduction. So um, we saw during the emergency how uh, these, uh, let's say, these different categories were interconnected in the implementation of, uh, let's say, for example, recovery uh, food plan. What we have seen uh, from, uh, let's say, the very beginning uh, uh, during the outbreak of the pandemic that, uh, as Stefania uh, said, uh, started at least in Europe, uh, here in the northern part of Italy and in Milan, is that uh, uh, cities uh, uh, which, with uh, um, well-established food policies, so strong cities under the category, in our case, of governance, uh, were more, uh, let's say, res uh, responsive in implementing uh, uh, a quick response uh, uh, during the, the pandemic outbreak. In the case of Milan, uh, in which I was um, directly involved in the, in, the co in the coordination of the food aid system, uh, we, uh, let's say, uh, were able to convert uh, the mechanism of uh, food waste reduction through the apps uh, the zero waste hub, apps in in uh, uh, food aid apps to serve, let's say, uh, the the people in need uh, in uh, throughout the city. Uh, in general, what what what, what we seen is that, uh, and I conclude on this slide, uh, is that uh, uh, mayors and city officer were. At the, at the very forefront uh, to providing immediate uh, food solution to citizen needs. So uh, we decided, let's say, to start to, to activate and to make available some tools for our cities that at the very beginning started with, let's say, nighttime calls among uh, officers to understand how to better manage the, the, the emergency situation. Um, so just to um, go ahead on uh, on um, on the presentation uh, here, uh, we um, launched a special edition of the Milan Pact Awards last year. It was the Milan Pact Talks uh, because we decided to uh, to um, let's say provide uh, immediate uh, inputs to um, uh, to city officers. So um, we keep a competitive way that, that, that were the Milan Pact Award to create, let's say, a list, a library of uh, video um, in which uh, signatory cities explain how they uh, were dealing uh, with uh, their, their planning in the emergency situation. So we have collected more than 100 videos that are available on our uh, YouTube channel and uh, uh, also in our YouTube to channel, you can find the record this uh, recording of the um, global forum that was uh, uh, exactly on this on this topic. Um, if we, um, I mean, from the 100 video, what we what we saw from our signatory cities were uh, the, the let's say their focus primary on three trends. Uh, the first one was, uh, of course, providing food aid and uh, uh, the issue of food aid uh, if uh, let's say in the previous years was was uh, uh, let's say a practice is uh, more coming uh, from uh, let's say the global south uh, during the pandemic of, co of course we were uh, in the global north and global south where uh, everyone dealing with this and uh, uh, so all the different models uh, and the, all the different plannings in which the, the cities provided or are providing food, uh, food aid uh, to the fragile part of the population. Uh, another important trend was uh, providing healthy diets. Uh, so um, awareness raising campaign, for example, of municipalities uh, um, explaining the importance uh, uh, during, let's say, the recovery of uh, uh, eating, let's say, well for their well-being. And for, for example, um, the reconversion of the service of the school canteen uh, meals uh, uh, that are, let's say, generally speaking, are um, healthy 
to, by creating, let's say, a home delivery service, for example, that can guarantee also at home the um, the um, uh, this uh, this service and the last one the last trend was about uh, recovering the food economy so the support that municipality uh, are giving for example to restaurants uh, or uh, uh, to local producer for example or the reorganization uh, of the local street markets or the wholesale market. Uh, we are going so all these uh, um, all these uh, um, videos are available on our YouTube channel, and uh, uh, we are going to launch a new edition of the Milan Pact Awards uh, on the first of April, and we expect uh, that uh, we receive uh, many practices, uh, let's say, under the the category of governance. Uh, that uh, that means that. Uh, Hopefully, cities are reorganizing their, their activities and writing, uh, uh, creating an established food plan for the next years. So we will expect to re receive, let's say, uh, fresh practices, updated practices from, uh, from our cities, uh, and many of them uh, will be on um, food planning. Uh, just one thing about uh, our last global forum in, uh, in, uh, in Barcelona. Uh, we organized uh, also a dedicated session uh, together with uh, um, the uh, City Council of Birmingham, focusing on uh, uh, the lesson learned on uh, on uh, during the pandemic on how to um, to um, create a proper food plan and also uh, giving to cities the opportunity to work uh, on. Uh, uh, the pledge on uh, on uh, a pledge on uh, guaranteeing food justice. But again, you you can uh, you can see the full recordings of this uh, of this session on our on our YouTube channel. Uh, lastly, the last resource that I want to share, and I think that uh, the Food Foundation also circulated it uh, for for this webinar, is uh, this. Uh, um, uh, report uh, made by under the project food also under the project food trails the euro cities uh, that is a very interesting uh, let's say report that is uh, let's say uh, presenting and and, and uh, assessing the, the different uh, food aid mechanism in uh, in european cities so uh, you can have a, a let's say a good overview from from this document from more than um, um, 40 cities in uh, in Europe. Uh, okay, so uh, I think I'm finished my time. Um, just just want to add okay. that together also with Stefania Siforti and um, many other uh, uh, stakeholders of the partners of the Milan Pact, we also organize a dedicated session during the UNFSS Pre Summit. Um, with the aim of showcase the role of cities, the importance of uh, uh, also food planning, and let's say the first part of uh, uh, of the of the this, this plenary session was uh, exactly on on the issue discussed uh, discussed today. So, if you would like to to know more about the resources uh, that are available for our signatory cities, you can. Uh, uh, or, or if you want to to know more about how to sign the Milan Pact, if you are a local authority, uh, just reach us out uh, uh, through the contacts that you see in the slide. Thank you so much. Thank you, Filippo. And I think one of your colleagues just put in chat a, a link to the YouTube videos. So thank you, Cecile, for that. And if you want to add anything else, are there any other questions for Filippo about MUFPP? Your chance to get all your questions answered. While we're waiting for that, Jess, I'm going to have you start to tee up your presentation. Thank you so much, Filippo. Any questions for Filippo? MUFPP? No, great. All right, we are going to turn it over to Jess, who is the associate of the Ruoff Global Partnership on Sustainable Urban Egg and Food Systems. She's the lead Ruoff consultant on the Climate and Pandemic Resilient City Program managed by Ruoff and FAO. And we think about this presentation as we've moved from emergency food plan. I love the visual, visual that 
um, Edwin presented as, and I mentioned in the beginning, right, we think about emergency food plan as being nested in the broader resilient strategies. And now we're moving through the webinar, right, we're moving in that exact model and talking about the broader initiatives and now um, the uh, a resilient food system initiative created with FAO. So with that, I'm going to hand it off to Jess. She can walk you through their amazing work. Thanks, Kim. Um, hi, everybody. Um, so as Kim said, I've been asked to talk today about the FAO Ruaf City Region Food System Program, which is an approach that aims to reinforce rural urban linkages for more resilient and sustainable food systems and contribute to wider food systems transformation. And it includes a specific focus on building resilience of food system stakeholders, assets and infrastructure to multiple possible future shocks and stresses, including cl uh, climate events and pandemics, but also anything else, any unknown events that may be just around the corner. So the approach involves assessment to build understanding of the functioning and performance of the city region food system, we call it the, the CRFS, and evidence-based action planning. And it is underscored by multi-stakeholder engagement and participation throughout. So what I'm going to do is explain the key concepts, explain the two pilot phases of the programme, and give a very brief run through of the process that we have developed. Um, before letting you know then um, at the end about some really useful resources which we'll be launching soon to help cities and city regions to do their own resilience assessments and uh, action planning. So let's look first at what we mean by a city region. So in geographical terms, a city region is defined as a larger urban center or a conglomeration of smaller urban centers and the surrounding and interspersed peri-urban and rural hinterland. In functional terms, a city region is an area in which flows of people, goods and ecosystem services operate across the rural urban continuum. And city regions extend across administrative boundaries, so they entail uh, urban rural partnerships and intermunicipal cooperation. So what is a city region food system then? In the center of this diagram are the urban rural linkages that we were just talking about and we advocate strength and connectivity between urban centers and the surrounding areas. The CRFS also encompasses all the activities, stakeholders and infrastructures and exchanges at all the uh, and between all the food supply chain nodes. That's the middle circle of the diagram. And then on the outside, you can see the outcome areas or the wider sustainability issues that food systems influence. So food security, nutrition, livelihoods and economic development, environmental and ecosystem services and social inclusion, inclusion and equity. So far, there have been two phases of the city region food system program. The first ran from 2015 to 2018. And it's based on the understanding that the food systems of city regions can make critical contributions to all aspects of sustainability. The initial assessment and planning approach was piloted in seven city regions, you can see on the slide. Very briefly, among the tangible outcomes and influences, Quito became the first city in Ecuador with a food strategy. And the CRFS assessment was fundamental to Quito's emergency food response to COVID-19. It allowed rapid identification of neighbourhoods with high vulnerable populations for targeted response. In Lusaka, also a, a long-term food policy council has been established since the end of the project. Then, from 2019, we added a more focused lens on resilience of city region food systems with an adapted methodology piloted in five cities. We started looking at resilience to climate hazards, um, but then along came COVID, obviously, and we uh, adapted our work to take account of the impacts of pandemic responses too. 
So here, the assessment is geared to identifying the hazards that might affect city region food system, the, the city region food system that you're looking at. Um, so climate shocks like hurricanes, floods and stresses like prolonged high temperatures and droughts, diseases themselves like workers getting sick and also uh, infection control measures like closure of markets, curfews and so on. The potential impacts on the food system the exposure, that is who and what, are located in areas that are most affected. The vulnerabilities, the factors that make certain people or things more susceptible. And resilience capacities, the ability to prevent, anticipate, absorb, adapt and transform in the wake of potential impacts. So once we know all of this, Action planning would hopefully be able to reduce the vulnerabilities and increase the resilience capacities and allow cities to respond better, more nimbly when the next emergency happens. So I know that some of the early findings from the pilot cities have been shared as fact sheets um, in the email sent by Florence. Um, I think it was, was yesterday's materials to accompany this webinar. So I encourage you to, to have a little look. So what exactly is the process? I don't have much time, so this will be quite a rapid gallop through the core modules and activities, um, which are shown on this slide with the multi-stakeholder participation, the stakeholders dialogue and governance as a central pillar to all the modules. The inception phase involves uh, determining entry points, securing political buy-in, setting up the team, developing the work plan, establishing an initial stakeholder advisory group. And this group drawn from um, stakeholders across the um, CRFS will be expanded later. And they'll do some participatory visioning to come up with an initial idea of what the CRFS could look like in, say, 5, 10 or 20 years time. And this vision is really helpful for anchoring the project, providing a shared reference point that can help to guide the discussion on what needs to happen. We define the CRFS, which means, first of all, determining the initial spatial or territorial boundaries that you're working within based on various combined criteria, which will provide the basis for spatial analysis of data, such as using GIS software. It also means uh, conducting a detailed stakeholder mapping analysis, looking into who is involved in every node, every nook and cranny of the food system, what they do, what their perspectives are, who they interact with, what the power relations are. Um, and this analysis will be the basis for expansion of the stakeholder advisory group, as well as drawing on this group for evidence for the assessment and outreach and engagement later on. The rapid scan is the first phase of the assessment and is based on existing secondary data and stakeholder knowledge and existing policies and programs relating to food. And the purpose of this module is to start building a general picture of the CRFS, the local context, how it functions, the main commodities, the food flows, the infrastructure and so on, to enable early identification of some initial priority areas for action. And this may be parts of the food system or particular key value chains. And then the in-depth assessments, the team collects primary data to really drill down and understand what's going on in some priority areas where the rapid scan has shown there are problems. And this is very much an indicator-led process. And we try to really unpack the causes of who is affected by a problem, um, how they're affected, where they're affected and why. Um, and we identify data sources like um, data collection methods, surveys, focus groups, and interviews, and so on. And then the findings, um, these, these causes, are used as the basis for action planning. So the stakeholder advisory group um, determines which issues should be addressed urgently, whether they need policy action or programs, whether in fact they need new policies or programs, or whether existing ones can be adapted. Working groups are formed to figure out how to put the actions in place, how to implement them, how to monitor them. And there's a really focused effort um, on outreach, mobilizing people who can get policies amended or adopted or secure funded funding. So we don't expect that all the actions will be firmly in place um, and implemented by the end of the project, but there'll be some progress and importantly, momentum and engagement should continue um, through a long-term governance platform. 
And then my last slide, as I'm running out of time, um, we are currently finalizing a new product, the CRFS Handbook and Revised Online Toolkit, which is scheduled to be launched sometime in March, or early April. And these resources actually cover both the main track and the climate pandemic track. So it's a bit of a choose your own adventure. The handbook sets out the modular process that I raced through above, while the toolkit provides supplementary resources like detailed explanations, workshop materials, training units, technical examples from the pilot cities. And the idea is that cities and city regions can use these resources to do their own assessments. And we're developing plans to form a community of practice for exchange of lessons and experiences. Um, between stakeholders in different places. And of course, RUAF is available for support and capacity building if required. Um, and my contacts uh, are on this slide together with the link where the new resources will appear. So that's it for me. Yes, um, thank you. Thanks. I really appreciate it. Um, so Tokiana unfortunately had something pop up and won't be able to join us. Uh, for this webinar. So I, I don't know, Jess, if you wanted to comment a little bit on what's happening in Madagascar, not to put you on the spot. So if you, if you don't feel like it, uh, would certainly understand. And I just want to just commend you on fitting in all of that information in 10 minutes. What you're trying to accomplish is amazing in those city region systems and building those resilient systems. This is what it takes. It's very complicated, involves a lot of different partners. It's an extended period of time and just really love the frameworks that RUAP and FAO have set up to help cities with it. Thanks, Kim. Yeah, that felt like quite a gallop through what is a really yeah. complicated um, <laughs> project that's been going on for a number of years. So I hope I wasn't talking too too quickly and kept people with me. Um, yeah, it's a shame that, that Tokiana hasn't been able to join us. Um, but what I realized, um, I actually pulled up some resources on my screen so I can share it a little bit. Obviously, we'd rather hear from, from him directly um, rather than, than me sitting in, in my home office in France. But um, just a little bit then, I mean, the, the city region of Antanarivo um, benefits from quite a dynamic flow of uh, local food products, um, but the, they're constantly challenged by climate events like heavy rainfalls, floods, extreme variations of temperature. And uh, the pandemic obviously has contributed to disruption of food supply chains and caused a significant increase in food security and malnutrition for the most vulnerable people. Um, so in Tana, um, they formed the participatory uh, working group with lots of participatory work, uh, workshops, conducted the rapid scan, um, which triggered dialogue over building a common framework for action um, between stakeholders of different backgrounds. Um, but they realized for the in-depth assessment, they really needed more information so they could understand how to respond better to the different uh, vulnerabilities. So they selected 13 key commodities and um, implemented an in-depth survey to map all the areas within the CRFS boundary that are exposed to climate hazards um, and where there are concentrations of vulnerable people. Um, and then they looked at the risk components within these areas um, in detail. They used focus groups, participatory mapping and group interviews, which included detailed information on infrastructure. So a couple of examples of um, particular areas and issues which um, they identified for to be addressed in action planning. Um, the community of Ampanafi, I hope I pronounced that right, um, in the south of the city is at the highest, highest risk of drought and tends to experience the highest level of crop losses. So most peri-urban farmers um, in that area focus on rice production, the main commodity in the food system that provides um, the uh, high level of revenue. Um, and there is a good road infrastructure between this area and the urban markets. Mm. Um, but the farmers showed that the, the sorry, the assessment showed these farmers would really benefit from interventions to build their technical capacity to mitigate the impact of drought on rice production. Um, and then a, a second um, key finding was communities in the immediate west of the urban area who produce vegetable crops. Um, and they registered both the highest level of flood risk and also high crop losses and low revenues. And they ranked high 
on the food consumption score, which is a proxy indicator for um, household caloric availability based on diversity and frequency of food groups over a seven day period, and also coping strategy index, um, which shows harmful coping strategies when faced with food insecurity. Um, so the assessment showed that these farmers could really benefit from assistance in adapting their production practices to preserve access to food for the urban poor. Um, so action planning is, is getting underway now in, in Tana. Mm -hmm. um, so we're poised to hear more um, about what they'll be able to put in place um, and develop over the coming years in response to um, these findings. Excellent. Jess, thank you for pinch hitting there. Serena or Filippo from MUFPP, did you want to mention a little bit about how that work also uh, dovetails with some of the Milan Pact work in the same city? Tana? it's okay not to put you on the spot as well. Feel free to weigh in, let, raise your hand or just jump in if you want to comment. Okay, we do have one question from Emmanuel. Oh, sorry, Florence, were you going to say something? I was just going to say, I just posted in the chat, but we do have a, a Takiana took part in our first webinar series. So if you are interested to hear him um, present, he's a fantastic speaker about how they use the MUFPP framework um, in, the, in the city of Antana Narivo, oh, then that's available on uh, the learning platform. If you go to the a food strategy for our city tab, and then you go down to the data mapping and audits um, uh, topic, you'll be able to find Takiana's talk under there. Thank you, Florence. And I have to say a big lesson learned from doing a web webinar series around emergency food. Uh, we tried really hard to get perspectives from cities that were actively engaged in emergency food uh, crises. And because of that, most of them were in the middle of a crisis and, and couldn't join our webinar series always. So it, it was a bit of a struggle. So certainly understand that, that, that Tokiana had something pop up and couldn't join. Great. All right. Uh, Kelsey, was there a question for Emmanuel? Yeah, for Emmanuel, uh, we have somebody wondering about the composition of the task force and how it's built to represent the voices of diverse groups in your city. Um, thank you for the question. Um, initially, the task force was uh, created with regards to, again, the, the three main objectives, which is to produce the food. Um, to create livelihood and as well as uh, health. So um, some of the members were the health department, the city veterinary department. We don't have an agriculture department um, because we are a city. Um, we also have uh, three departments which are related to um, the, uh, uh, livelihood. Okay? Um, we have the small business cooperative development unit. Uh, we also have the investment affairs unit and so on. So this was just the initial um, composition of the task force, but there was a, a statement there that any department that's needed. So eventually when we talked about developing uh, urban farms, we had to engage engineering because there were certain earthworks, um, access to water, access to electricity. So the task force actually um, started to evolve um, inviting additional uh, departments. We even had to engage the fire department um, where in which um, they, they as a response would uh, fill up uh, drums and, and water containers for areas that have no access to, to, to water uh, easily. So um, I, uh, <clears throat> we, I have a screen, but I, I haven't uh, prepared that. So it's about, we started with about 10 departments and it has expanded to add um, also part of the task force, we had uh, two members from the legislative department as we had to create um, uh, laws. And we had uh, sectoral representatives from the agribusiness sector um, um, and uh, the, the ag ag agribusiness sector. The one was represented by the church um, and, and another one. So Great. pretty much that's how it was composed. Emmanuel, thank you for that. That's incredibly helpful. We also have a question for Edwin. Edwin, I yeah, Kelsey, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, somebody's wondering if, um, if in your work you encounter significant policy conflicts between departments 
Um, and if so, what kinds of conflicts is there? Are there competing understandings of what's driving food insecurity in general in Austin, or is everybody pretty well aligned on the root causes here? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and without question, there's a lot of um, differing, differ, different views on um, the origins of food insecurity and and the city's role. And I tried to touch on that a little bit. Uh, we certainly don't have a comprehensive policy around the right to food. Um, and that is um, a pretty interesting discussion that's taking place around the country and around the world. Um, there's not a clear you know, policy mandate uh, to address food insecurity. Um, it's not a stated thing that it's the city's or any government's role to ensure that um, everybody has access to sufficient, healthy, affordable, culturally appropriate food. Um, you know, obviously, from my perspective, I think that would be a pretty good thing, um, but we don't have that. So um, that said, within the city of Austin, we do have a pretty good working relationship across departments. The much bigger challenge would be the relationship between the city of Austin and our state government. And I won't swerve too far into that because uh, it's highly political for a lot of reasons, but um, the state government essentially in Texas has very different views about the role of government and the support of a social safety network. Um, this, the federal government sends money down and resources to the state, which are then supposed to be redistributed down to municipal governments. The state chooses often to restrict that flow of resources in various ways and make it difficult to create a really functional social safety network. Um, everything from our um, SNAP benefits, aka food stamps, how that program is managed, when it's implemented in various ways. So tremendous challenges for all major cities in the state of Texas interacting with the state government in terms of uh, getting on the same page about what we should be doing, what our role is. Essentially, the state government views its role as minimizing regulation to encourage economic uh, growth. And, um, you know, we view that a little bit differently at the city of Austin. So great question, really significant challenges. Um, so hopefully we'll find some resolution somehow, somewhere. Thanks, Edwin. It's really helpful. Anyone else before we move on to Barbara? I'm going to pass it off to you. Barbara does not have a presentation. She's just going to provide some commentary here. But before Barbara jumps on, anyone else? Any other questions? Just to, just to jump in, there was um, a quick question earlier, just a practical one from um, uh, for Emmanuel. If there's any further detail on the um, procurement policy that you, you mentioned, that you could share? Well, I already sent in the chat box the actual executive order, as well oh, as an, another that. link. Uh, okay. That's okay. Yeah, but great, um, maybe one of the things that I want to share, which is connected to the question of Edwin, of course, our point of view is of a, a third world uh, country in, in Asia. I think one of the challenges in the food response that we observed is that most of the relief goods that we give in are highly processed food. And again, it's because of the infrastructure, the perishability issues and, and so on and so forth. Um, but because of a prior um, experience uh, of uh, Yolanda, which is a major um, disaster where the uh, communities were fed processed food for a long period of time. At that time, three months was long. Um, there was significant observation of increase in terms of hypertension, diabetes, and so on and so forth. So the challenge of distributing food, um, so the question of accessibility and availability versus the nutritional aspect of things. So this is, was really a, a struggle between the departments of trying to act fast and quick, you know, uh, at the same time trying to address uh, nutrition in that sense. So the Healthy Procurement Act was actually made as a pact and try to, um, if you look at the expenses uh, that the local government is spending in terms of dialysis machines for, for um, kidney problems or hypertension, giving out free medicines and so on and so forth. The idea is that we need to invest in healthier food because if you look at the cost of health by, by and large, uh, the government is still looking out um, for these sectors. 
So the idea of putting a healthy procurement app is to try to introduce um, uh, healthier food or the consideration of, uh, um, how do you call this, uh, the, the sugar levels and so on and so forth. But primarily to uh, follow the food plate where in which you can have a, a more balanced diet. So basically the availability of greens and, and more fresh vegetables, whole foods for that matter. So those are the principles. Um, the law is there, but again, implementation and the details, these are um, things to uh, consider, particularly with the concept of the, the concept um, that healthy food needs to be expensive, is expensive. So, and that's where through the C40 network, we've, we've had discussions um, of other cities that have proven that healthy food can be affordable. And we, um, in relation to that, we've compiled uh, through partnerships with other agencies, local and foreign, of healthy yet affordable food uh, based on uh, recipes or, or ingredients that can be readily grown uh, within the city. Thanks, Thank Emmanuel. You. For that, that's really helpful. And I would encourage everyone to review all of the four earlier webinars. This was a, a, a sub theme throughout all four of them. And the reason it's getting more attention in the emergency food space is when emergency food was really days or maybe a week, the healthiness of it wasn't so much of a consideration. When it's months and years, the healthy aspect of that emergency food is really, really important. And you heard that from Birmingham, England with the pandemic. You heard it from the World Food Program that was saying their, their rice and bean ration wasn't meant to sustain people for uh, multi-generations, even in the case of the World Food Program. So that is an emerging issue, I'd say, that, that we'd, we all need to deal with. Um, I, we need to move on, but this is a really important, I'm just gonna, Emmanuel, back to you. This is from Guido, just asking, how did you manage to reach the hard to reach group? Because this is really critical um, for, for all of the emergency food. There's always 90% that accessible part of networks, and then there's the very hard to reach. Well, are we, well, just to clarify, is this a infrastructure challenge or is it really identification? Um, we do if you I wanna, assume, let me just clarify that it may be somebody registered as Guido, but not Guido. We have, I think, 30. Yeah, uh, I, I'm, I'm the real Guido. I'm the, oh, the real Guido. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Manuel. I'm Guido, and I'm the inclusive uh, climate action project officer at C40. And from an inclusive point of view, my, my question was, how practically did you, did you manage like, to reach you know, the vulnerable communities? Did you create a sort of campaign or like with the social department or practic practically how did you manage them? How did you reach them? Th thank you for the answer, uh, for the question, sorry. I think one of the most useful guiding principle we had was we had to prioritize. So identifying the most food vulnerable sectors was key. Um, we had the data from the health department as well as the educational department where we had the highest cases of stunting, malnourish, and um, wasting. Uh, these are all different uh, age levels. And with that, we put these two data together and try to identify uh, districts. There are six districts in, in Quezon City. And it just so happened, um, I guess it's common logic uh, as we look at it later on at the data, where high concentration of informal sectors, um, this is where food vulnerability comes in, particularly when loss of jobs um, normally uh, affect those at the lower uh, levels of the workforce. So with that data alone, we were, uh, able to target this, and we have uh, local barangays. That's our our sec our our units, and uh, because of of resources, we had to just focus on those more food vulnerable, um, so that when there are donations from the private sector and so on and so forth, we knew where to prioritize. So 
uh, we had to engage the uh, uh, local government, um, the police, as well as national government, because the military were uh, controlling the checkpoints. And as long as we, we were able to influence that uh, food is essential, there should, there should be no uh, disruption with the food flow. So uh, part of that is that uh, we, we issued passes and part of the passes that uh, the national government uh, uh, gave out did not identify urban farms. So on a local level, we uh, ensured to, that local urban farmers are recognized uh, as essential workers. So um, again, a, a lot of partnerships and a lot of uh, understanding that um, yes, we need to uh, slow down or isolate ourselves or reduce movement, but we cannot allow food, uh, the food flow to, to be as effective. So I, I hope that uh, answered your question. Yes, yes, many thanks, Emmanuel. Thank you, thank you both. That's great. With that, I'm gonna hand it over to Barbara Emanuel. She's a consulting partner to a lot of the organizations uh, including our own uh, on this webinar today. She's a Ruoff partner, former manager of Toronto Food Strategy. Prior to work on the food strategy, she was a strategic policy advisor to the medical officer of the Health of Toronto, whom she's been involved in the city of Toronto public health issues for over 25 years. So Barbara, I'm gonna hand it off to you for about eight, eight or nine minutes. Okay, thanks a lot, Kim, and hi, everybody. So um, I've been asked to try to give my observations and perhaps somewhat summarize uh, the webinar series. Um, and a lot of what I'm going to say is not going to be news to anybody uh, working in a local authority or city context. But what I'm going to try to do is to sort of weave together some thoughts that have emerged from the whole webinar series. So um, jumping in here, cities are, of course, the level of government closest to community and are therefore often in a position of responding uh, directly to community needs and local crises. Uh, while local authorities all over the world often don't have sufficient legislative or regulatory power, nor the resources and capacity to mobilize comprehensive responses, they often find themselves in that role. I have to think that this situation sounds very familiar to city officials the world over. Overall, the pandemic and other crises uh, demonstrate the need for both horizontal and vertical integration to ensure effective response. So horizontal uh, integration, we've talked a lot about that, uh, is essentially uh, about involving uh, colleagues from right across the city, from multiple departments, and even those uh, divisions and departments that don't necessarily see themselves as doing anything uh, around food. And vertical integration is about aligning and collaborating with senior levels of government uh, or uh, other levels of government, whether provincial or state or national. So uh, vertical integration up, but I also think it's equally important the vertical integration into the community, the collaboration with local partners. So all cities faced and are continuing to face the need for emergency food provision during the pandemic. And in many situations also having to respond to climate emergencies and other disasters. And we know that these shocks exacerbate, greatly exacerbate the existing stresses like food insecurity. Uh, some cities, of course, are much better prepared than others and can relatively quickly mobilize existing relationships, infrastructure capacity, resources, and available research and analysis to support effective response. But most of us, during the pandemic particularly and in other disasters, found ourselves having to respond to the emergency in real time, figuring things out as we went along and doing an admirable job, but in a highly stressful situation. 
So I have to think that having some emergency food planning in place before crises hit can help alleviate some of that stress and at the same time maximize the use and equitable distribution of all available resources and supports. In my own city, the city of Toronto, for example, we were lucky to have an existing food team. And by comparison with many cities across the world, we had some ready available resources. Uh, but our team's research and data, our existing relationships that we have had built over many years, and the available expertise were not effectively mobilized for quite a few weeks after the pandemic hit. Our emergency operations center uh, hadn't uh, a, a dedicated food security component, although of course everyone knows that getting enough good food to everyone who needs it, with a particular emphasis on the most vulnerable, is absolutely essential in any crisis. So what can we do about this going forward? We have to go forward assuming that crises are inevitable. So this webinar series provided some excellent analysis and case studies from all across the globe and together help paint the picture uh, of the need for effective emergency planning and response. Some of the presentations demonstrated effective strategies and responses for more extreme contexts where there's massive food insecurity and population instability. Others demonstrated excellent example, examples of sustainable food system strategies and responses that promote resilience, food system resilience, community resilience, household resilience. Together, all the presentations showed how resourceful and innovative city officials and other partners are in dealing with these emergencies. These case studies and examples provide useful context and together can point to a roadmap to help cities move towards community, household and food system resilience in the face of crisis. But I have to say that the missing link for me in the series is a clear articulation of the practical, tactical elements to support cities in mobilizing effective emergency planning and response, and therefore, by extension, healthy and sustainable emergency recovery. In other words, we still need to come together to share and define the practical steps and required resources to establish emergency plans or strategies with those steps fully recognizing that there are multiple entry points and different pieces in place already or different pieces missing for different cities across the world. Ideally, I believe a baseline food flow analysis would be really useful to help us understand where our food comes from and how it's distributed across the city with a particular emphasis on that last mile analysis. In other words, how our food gets to the very neighborhood level and how and where people are able to access it or not access it. I recognize that a comprehensive food flow analysis can be quite resource and labor intensive and that many cities don't have the capacity to do that. However, even a basic understanding of food flow, including where our food comes from, how it's transported across the city, available logistics capacity, including warehousing, available energy and transportation infrastructure, in other words, overall supply chain analysis is really useful to inform and to support emergency food response. This includes equitable distribution of all available resources, both during an emergency and to address ongoing stresses like food insecurity. In other words, cities must consider both hard infrastructure capacity and neighborhood level vulnerabilities. 
Establishing a dedicated food team, of course, is ideal, but this isn't always possible. Whether or not it's a specific team, we have to move forward to identify and develop the capacity to coordinate our emergency food response, to facilitate partner support, to mobilize resources across multiple departments, and to promote collaboration with other levels of government, private sector donors and other funders, as well as community leaders. If possible, the assigned officials would also be in a position to consult, consolidate all available data and collect, conduct analyses of existing gaps and vulnerabilities, and thus play the role of a tactical team that involves partners across the city and all other key stakeholders. Ideally, as I said, this capacity should be developed prior to an emergency situation so it can be activated quickly. And I recognize that not all cities have the capacity to do that, but I do know that all cities are innovative and strategic and can leverage existing resources and capacity across multiple de departments and stakeholders. So on reflection, effective emergency food response is about leveraging all available resources and applying them equitably, identifying and leveraging all available data and research to support effective response. It's about leveraging existing relationships with colleagues across the city, with community leaders, funders, and private sector stakeholders. These three components must work together since the absence of any one of them hinders effective response. Cities, of course, can engage in this process from multiple entry points and can build on where they're at already. As I've said, cities are really good at being innovative and strategic and often with very few resources. The pandemic response has shown that really clearly. But sometimes it's hard to align all the data elements, resources, and relationships. So I finish by saying, let this be a call to action for developing practical, tactical, and emergency food response strategies that promote resilient food systems and resilient communities. Cities have a major role to play. Thanks, Barbara. We really appreciate that comprehensive reflection. Really appreciate it. Um, just in the interest of time, we're going to hand it off to Anna as our final, pre final presenter here. She joined the Food Foundation as first executive director in 2015. Prior to that, brings a, a host of experience from the humanitarian aid and especially on nutrition. So with that, Anna. Thanks very much, Kim. Um, and uh, great to be um, at this point in the webinar series, I have to say I found it an enormously stimulating set of presentations this afternoon. So a huge thank you to the to the speakers. And I think reflecting back on the whole series, um, really congratulations to to Kim and Kelsey and Florence and Charlene who um, have I think curated a really wonderful set of resources through the through the webinar series. I, I listened to that. I haven't, wasn't able to join most of them, and I listened to them kind of back to back over the weekend, and it was just so so kind of enriching hearing from all of these very different sets of contexts um, and the, the hearing the speakers pull out some of the learnings. And I think the the highlight. I mean, we began this journey. Um, when we, we tr facilitated a partnership with Birmingham City Council and Pune in India. Um, and through that work, we're just very struck by the potential and value of bringing people together from diverse settings with related problems and hearing them interact with one another and share their ideas and the sort of power of that kind of peer-to-peer -peer exchange. Um, and I think, We've got a lot more of that through this series. So a few highlights. If you haven't been able to go to any of the others, I'm hoping this will pique your appetite to go and listen to some of the other um, videos of the, of the webinar. So early on, we heard from um, 
Bobby Zachariah in Pune, who had has been working with a charity called Lighthouse, who works with young people. And during really early on in the pandemic, they basically work with young people who are very isolated and from very uh, uh, low income backgrounds, living in a lot of the sum dwellings in, in the city to man the telephone lines, helplines for citizens and help with the distribution of food. And it was a really powerful example of sort of using those resources. I mean, to some of the points that Barbara's been saying, using the resources that are there and really pursuing that bigger, longer term vision around supporting livelihoods while at the same time mobilizing an effective response to the pandemic. Um, I love the two case studies we had in different webinars from Turkey. Um, uh, from Izmir and on the other side of the country from Gaziantep. I'm not sure if I pronounced that exactly correctly, but Fuat talked in that presentation about the, the um, opportunity really, which the influx of Syrian refugees has meant for the city and the way that the city has sort of embraced that emer so-called emergency by really looking at the assets which those refugees were bringing to the city and, and, and finding ways to um, uh, allow that community to flourish and contribute to the whole sort of city life. It was a very inspiring story, I thought. And then we also heard um, an amazing webinar where we, where we did a sort of deep dive into the Puerto Rican situation, the hurricane dealing with um, huge, massive emergency um, in Hurricane Maria. And, um, and hearing really about some of the points that Barbara said, the how um, there was this sort of lack of mapping of the resources which were already there and the, all the confusion that that created at the beginning of the emergency of not knowing where retailers were based, not knowing where different community capacity was residing. So therefore the emergency response coming in and not being able to really dock into that resource that already existed again loads of interesting thoughts and reflections. And then today, I think for me, a highlight was definitely hearing from Emmanuel um, and uh, the story in Kazan. Um, and what a remarkable story. Um, and so delighted to have had a chance to hear it directly from you, Emmanuel, so thank you. So I, I would just, I think the point really now is to look ahead and to, to think about how we can use this resource um, going forward. Um, and um, I, I hope that you've had a chance to dip into the platform a little bit, these tactics to try a great little sort of thumbnail resources where you can at a glance get signposted to different things. Um, and perhaps you'd be, you could have a little think about people that you know in other cities or colleagues of yours in the city that you work in that might benefit from seeing some of those resources. We'd really like to get this amplification effect of you passing materials on to people that you think might value them. It's a completely free resource, obviously, and uh, is intended to be a, you know, a really handy one stop shop to weigh into finding resources, which many of the other organisations represented here have brilliantly produced and signposting you to them on issues where, where you're where you're trying to get inspiration on particular things. So we'd love also your feedback. Um, and I think we'd, we'd love to know whether or not you're finding the materials useful because that will help us think about what, if anything, we should do next. And then I think what we're, we're also now thinking about is how we can work with 22 um, Commonwealth cities in the run up to the Birmingham's hosting of the Commonwealth Games in the summer um, in you know, a few months time. Um, and what we'll be we'll be doing in advance of that is creating another webinar series for those 22 cities to start to tell the story of the journey that they've been going on. Um, and we'll be then convening those cities in Birmingham with an opportunity again for a lot more of this um, peer to peer support and exchange and hopefully also um, creating opportunities for those cities to join um, the networks which have been represented here. Um, uh, you know, particularly MUFPP and finding a way to make sure that those cities then become part of those bigger global communities. So um, a huge thank you from me. Um, it's been wonderful to hear um, from this amazing work that's been happening and I have a chance to reflect on the lessons which have come from it and a big thank you to, to Kim and Kelsey again. 
Great. Thank you so much, Anna. And I'd just like to echo all of your thanks to our speakers and to Kim and Kelsey. And thank you all for sticking with us um, throughout the series and throughout this afternoon. Just before we uh, say goodbye, I just wanted to draw your attention to the learning platform. I'm going to attempt to share my screen. Um, hopefully it will work. I lost my Wi-Fi five minutes before the webinar started. So I've been um, tethering from my phone and I hope it, it will work. So um, bringing up my screen here and Kim, could you give me a nod if that's working? Yes. No, it's not quite. Oh, there it goes. Yes. Great. So this is our learning platform. And as Anna said, we've just one stop shop. We haven't uh, recreated by any means. What we've done is we've taken the creme de la creme of resources that we have found um, really helpful and we have compiled them here into this learning platform. So you can see here we've got different areas that you can go into. You can browse. To, to learn and just to expand your knowledge, or you can use it to specifically drill down into issues that you're working on. So for example, you can go into food. In each of these different topics, you'll find um, some really great case studies from all over the world, and you'll find key resources. Um, under our resources section, we've broken it down into frameworks and guidelines. Um, we've got uh, global networks and declarations. Uh, we've got reports with case studies and best practices and useful websites. A set learning uh, first webinar series on food strategies, uh, emergency food planning series that we're looking at now. We have monthly features and at the bottom of our newsletter and also provide feedback, as Anna said. Uh, and just to give you a quick view of the um, how the emergency food planning section um, is arranged, you'll see that for each of the web is a recording of the webinar. Um, each speaker is a uh, time marked with their presentation attached. You can download those presentations. Um, and then under each um, topic, you can find the uh, related resources that we have compiled, that are useful case studies, news articles, and those tactics to try throughout the webinar. So I really hope that you find this um, a useful resource. Like we said, we would love to have your feedback on what is working, what isn't working, and we would love for this resource to help more people um, to really shift, um, shift the food systems within their localities. Um, so that just leads me to thank everyone for your time this afternoon. Huge thank again to Kim and Kelsey via our newsletter and hopefully see you all again um, at our next webinar series. So thank you very much and um, enjoy the rest of your days. Bye everyone.